Uh, good morning. Welcome to the <clears throat> Woodrow Wilson International uh, Center for Scholars. It's uh, my pleasure, pleasure to welcome you to the Director's Forum with John Lewis Gaddis, who will be discussing his landmark new book, The Cold War, A New History. Uh, let me acknowledge the outstanding work of Christian Osterman and the Wilson Center's Cold War International History Project, uh, who has helped put all this together for today's event. Uh, through their groundbreaking work with the primary sources of one of the 20th century's uh, pivotal events, uh, Christian and his team have made the Cold War International History Project an invaluable resource for any scholar of the Cold War, <clears throat> as I think our speaker this morning will acknowledge. Uh, with each passing year, it becomes more difficult to remember how high the stakes were uh, during the Cold War. For nearly 50 years, mankind feared, uh, even expected, nuclear holocaust. Democracy and capitalism faced off against totalitarianism and communism. International relations and the foreign policy of the United States was completely guided by the backdrop of the conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union. What happened? Why did things turn out the way they did? John Lewis Gaddis has spent his career addressing these fundamental questions, establishing himself as our leading scholar of the Cold War. With this book, The Cold War, A New History, he joins the benefit of hindsight with a lifetime of expertise to answer these questions anew in a remarkably lucid and succinct volume. His first book, The United States and the Origins of the Cold War, was published in 1972. He's gone on to write or edit over 10 books, several of which address the Cold War. In 2004, he published the widely acclaimed Surprise, Security, and the American Experience, turning his formidable talents to the post 9-11 era. He is currently the Robert A. Lovett Professor of History and Political Science at Yale University. Over the years he has taught at Oxford, Princeton, the United States Naval War College, the Uni University of Helsinki, Ohio University, and of course he, as all of you know, he got his start as a professor at Indiana University Southeast. He received his PhD from the University of Texas in 1968. In 2005, he received the National Humanities Medal from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Let me add that he is a founding father and longtime member of the Advisory Committee for the Wilson Center's Cold War International History Project. He's also a former Wilson Center Fellow. His talk today is entitled, Reconsidering the Cold War. Professor Gaddis, welcome back to the Center, and we look forward to your comments. Thank you, Lee, and thanks to all of you for coming um, out. In many ways, it seems like home, except that home when I was here was not this building, but it was the old castle, which was indeed an exotic location for the um, Wilson Center. Um, I understand we have a lot of high school students here today. Is that correct? Could the high school students please yeah, indicate their presence? Yes, thanks. Good to see you. Good to see you guys. Um, 
I thought I would talk out, uh, start, start out this talk um, by talking about a conversation that I had with a high school student just a couple of weeks ago. High school students are getting more and more precocious as time goes on, I've noticed. Um, and I had a message out of the blue uh, just a couple of weeks ago from a high school student um, in um, New Haven named Khalid who um, already has his own blog website and does sophisticated running commentary on historical methodology. Um, and Khalid, Khalid got in touch with me and said he wished to talk with me about the question of historical maturity. And then he said, the dates on which I am available are as follows. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, fine, uh, I will try to accommodate your schedule, Khalid. <laughs> Uh, and um, he actually came over to the house and we had uh, quite a lengthy conversation about the concept of um, historical maturity. And I really got rather interested in that idea. It was not a term that I had used uh, before myself uh, in the past, but reading Khalid's blog on this, I learned some things. Um, and would sort of like to make that the theme of uh, what I'm talking about um, this morning. Um, Khalid uh, describes uh, historical maturity, and I would agree with him, as the ability to step back from the uh, details and also from the emotions that surround the great events through which we have lived. Now, this is not a problem for you guys uh, on the Cold War, but it is a problem for the older people sitting in the front of the room. Uh, the ability to um, back off and see an event uh, in its entirety, see it from beginning to end, see all of the different things that were going on during that event, which of course no observer uh, at the time could have seen. This is uh, Khalid's definition of historical maturity, a certain detachment, a certain stepping back to look at the bigger picture. And of course, it's impossible to do that without the work of archivists who provide the sources uh, that give us the evidence uh, to do that. And this, of course, is what this project here, the Cold War Project, uh, is about. But it seems to me the um, end product of all of this archival research should at some point be a kind of stepping back to look at this large picture. And um, so I think that's what I'm doing. I think I actually, without thinking too much about it, have become historically mature after all these years, <laughs> uh, at least by colleagues' definition. <clears throat> um, the difference in the perspective that you get on an event like the Cold War from stepping back uh, and trying to take in the entire view was best symbolized uh, for me uh, in the process of uh, actually writing this new book which has a totally unoriginal title, The Cold War. Uh, I'm getting a lot of complaints from my students about the unoriginality of my titles. I'm also getting complaints about the blandness of the cover of this book. If you've seen this book, and there's some copies of it outside, uh, it has a rather bland cover. It just has lettering, on, uh, kind of uh, uh, gold lettering on white background, and uh, the question has arisen, why is the cover of this book so bland? This actually comes around to the question of historical maturity. There is a tale to be told here. When I finished writing the book, or was in the finishing stages of writing the book, the publisher began submitting uh, proposed covers, as publishers do. And the first one that came through had a great array of missiles, uh, Soviet missiles up here, <laughs> American missiles down here and the little phrase Cold War in between. It was known as the Jaws cover. <laughs> and I wrote back and said, no, this will never do. The book is uh, trying to make the point that the Cold War was about more than just missiles. So they said, OK. And then they came back with a really yucky radiation symbol, you know, kind of greenish yellow with a cloud of radioactive uh, cloud in the background. No, no, I said, this won't do. It's not about just about uh, radiation and atomic bombs. Uh, so they went back to the drawing board, literally, uh, and came back with another one, which was a picture of the globe encircled with barbed wire. Uh, <laughs> and I said, no, this will not do either. Uh, the Cold War was about more than just um, barbed wire. And I think we went through one more. <laughs> 
which was um, a great array of artillery uh, pointed at each other, uh, big battleship guns or something like that. And I said, no, it's not about battleship guns either. So finally they said, well, what do you think it was about? What kind of cover would you like to have? And I said, um, I want the famous Greek vase that shows Achilles and Ajax uh, having stacked their shields uh, and their swords, propped them up against the wall, taken off their helmets, their helmets are at their feet, and they've turned over or turned upside some kind of a drum, and on top of that drum they're playing a game. It may be checkers, it may be chess, we don't know for sure what it is. But here are these warriors who have stacked their weapons and are still competing, but they are competing in a game in which everybody understands what the rules are. I said, that's what I want for my cover. They said, no way. People, <laughs> people will think it's Greek history, <laughs> despite the fact it says Cold War. <laughs> so we compromised on this rather bland cover. And I think that summarizes in a nutshell um, the difficulty of distinguishing historical memory, the images that people have in their mind from the experiences they lived through, from historical writing, which is something else again. Historical writing has got to achieve this detachment. It's got to go beyond what people remember. It's got to merge the memories of many people, but it's also got to integrate those uh, with the record. And then it's got to back off and ask the question, well, what does all of this mean and how does it compare to what had happened uh, in the past? Or even perhaps to speculate about how it compares to what might happen uh, in the future. Now, the original title of this book, because I was worried about using another Cold War title, this is the 8th or 9th or 17th or whatever it is, the original title of this book was going to be From Fear to Hope, because that basically is the thesis of the book, that the Cold War started as an extraordinarily fearful period. I even start with George Orwell isolated on his little Scottish island in the late 1940s, composing uh, the most famous of all the Cold War novels. 1984, a truly bleak view of what the future would hold. And I describe a trajectory that went from the fears of that period to the hope with which the Cold War ended. And I even make the point in the preface, in the introduction uh, to the book, um, that when we actually got to 1984, one of the first things that happened was the appearance on television of a movie actor that Orwell would have known about from his career as a film critic. This movie actor happened to be president of the United States. And he made a famous speech in January of 1984, right at the beginning of Orwell's year, but it was not an Orwellian speech. It was Reagan's famous speech in which he said, if a hypothetical American couple, Jim and Sally, could simply get together with a hypothetical Soviet couple, Ivan and Anya, and there was no language barrier between them, and if they could just have dinner and talk about their kids and maybe see a movie together, they would discover that they had no differences among themselves, that the differences that existed in the Cold War were the creations of ideologies and of states and of military industrial complexes, but there really was nothing to argue about. And therefore, there was the basis uh, for a resolution of Cold War differences. And this came uh, something like uh, 13 months before Gorbachev um, ever became leader uh, of the Soviet Union. So my point is the actual year, 1984, was very different from the year that Orwell described in his great novel, which I assume almost everybody in this room has read uh, at one time or another. And I thought that was an interesting story. And that's why I wanted originally to call the book From Fear to Hope. But it was pointed out to me that this would probably be regarded as a touchy-feely self-help book. Uh, uh, the kind of thing that goes on Oprah. <laughs> and then on second thought, we just say, well, maybe that would not be too bad to go on Oprah. But nonetheless, by that time, we had dropped the title and uh, had gone um, uh, back to the Cold War, uh, a new history. Well, what is the basis for this claim? Uh, 
that we should remember the Cold War as a hopeful period rather than as a horrible period, despite the fact that it seemed horrible to the people that we were living through it at the time. I think the answer is that the Cold War established certain things that were contested issues at the time that it began and are today no longer contested issues or are no longer contested issues to the extent that they once were. One of these is one that everybody will be familiar with, which is that nuclear weapons were developed but uh, after having been used twice in August of 1945 to end World War II were not used again at any point in the history of the 20th century or since. That would have astonished the people who developed atomic bombs in World War II. That would have astonished uh, most of the people who were trying to wrestle with the geopolitical significance of the atomic revolution uh, in these early days uh, of the Cold War. It's quite an unexpected development. Uh, the idea that great nations with great antagonisms would develop great weapons and then would choose not to use them. This, uh, I can think of only one example in previous history when this happened, and this was the non-use of poison gas in World War II. But remember, poison gas was used with devastating effect uh, in World War I. But always before the invention of new weapons going all the way back to bows and arrows and slingshots and stones, uh, these weapons had been used, occasions had been found upon which uh, to use them. And it seems to me it's quite a remarkable thing in the long history of the world that this didn't happen in the Cold War. And I think that's partly what my friend Khalid means by historical maturity, is to be able to put one particular event like this in the context of the very long history uh, of world affairs and see what it looks like in that regard. I also wanted to suggest in this book how easily it could have gone the other way, how easily a nuclear war could have broken out. And so I had a little fun at the beginning of chapter two, which describes the Chinese intervention in Korea and the famous press conference in which Mr. Truman was asked whether General MacArthur had the authority to use the atomic bomb and President Truman misspoke and said that he's got the authority to use anything he wants and the White House later retracted that almost instantly. But I write a couple of counterfactual paragraphs at the beginning of chapter two uh, on what might have happened if Mr. Truman had not retracted that and I say that MacArthur was given the authority to use atomic bombs, and he did indeed use some atomic bombs against the invading Chinese coming down the Korean Peninsula, and that the Russians, who had then only a rudimentary capability but were capable of reaching Pusan and Seoul, did and destroyed them, which caused MacArthur to retaliate by uh, uh, taking out Vladivostok, which caused the Russians then to take out Tokyo, and then this leads to um, an exchange in Europe, and the whole balloon goes up. Don't write this down, guys, on your, on your exam. <laughs> this is just a counterfactual scenario. And I'm already worried about liability issues because of the number of people who have fallen out of their chairs when they have read this um, thing. <laughs> uh, but my point is simply that uh, it could so easily have gone the other way, and it didn't. And it didn't because there was statecraft, there was statesmanship, indeed, on both sides. Uh, we know that Stalin was as impressed with the power and the danger of atomic weapons as Truman was. It was because the scientists themselves successfully made the point to their political masters about the environmental dangers of using uh, these weapons. It was because a sense of common danger emerged much earlier than the moment at which Reagan, in his own uh, inimitable way of characterizing issues, explained this common danger when he first met Gorbachev at the Geneva summit in 1985. President Reagan is said to have said to Gorbachev, uh, you know, if the Martians should land tomorrow, uh, we would immediately have no differences among ourselves and we would unite to uh, contest the Martian danger. Isn't the nuclear danger the functional equivalent of a Martian invasion. Gorbachev's a little bit at a loss because uh, Marxism-Leninism provided no answer for this kind of question. <laughs> but um, he eventually came around to uh, accepting uh, 
that Ronald Reagan was himself a nuclear abolitionist, the only one ever to have been president of the United States, and uh, Gorbachev picked up on that, and this led to the remarkable Reykjavik summit when these two leaders came very close to signing agreements that would have abolished uh, nuclear weapons. All of this is a remarkable trajectory, unparalleled, as far as I can tell, in the history of the development of great weapons by great powers, and I think it's one of the reasons why we should remember <coughs> the Cold War in a positive uh, rather than in a negative uh, sense. Uh, what could have happened didn't happen. A second reason, it seems to me, why we should remember the Cold War positively is that it settled, I think once and for all, a very fundamental question about how societies should be organized. The debate over how societies should be organized goes all the way back, certainly, to the uh, middle of the 19th century at the time that uh, Karl Marx was writing. Uh, the question of social and economic inequality and what should be done about it. Will the workings of market capitalism even out these inequalities, or must there be state intervention in the sense of a command economy? to redistribute wealth uh, in such a way as to enter, uh, uh, even out these inequalities. And of course, the latter was Marx's uh, answer. Uh, and the periodic crises of capitalism in the late 19th century and the early 20th century gave that answer a good deal of credibility, which had something to do with the onset of the Bolshevik Revolution and Lenin's refinement of Marx, which is that not only must there be a command economy to redistribute wealth, but there must be a single commander of the command economy. There must be a dictatorship of the proletariat that uh, uh, people will be told how to become free, how to become prosperous by a dictator at the top. This is what the Bolshevik Revolution was all about. And of course, it didn't work out as planned. But for anybody who was observing events from the standpoint of the 1930s or even the mid-1940s, Intelligent people could have said that perhaps a command economy on the Soviet model is as desirable or as practical a solution as uh, democratic politics and market economics, because democratic politics and market economics had not done very well in the 1930s, as we all know, and there was no uh, guarantee that the conditions of the 1930s would not return at the end of World War II. I think the Cold War settled that issue once and for all also, and it settled that issue really rather rapidly, chiefly through American action in creating the Marshall Plan and undertaking the obligation to rehabilitate the two great centers of industrial military power that were devastated at the time, Germany and Japan, but to couple that uh, rehabilitation, that economic rehabilitation, with the institution of democratic politics, uh, a form of politics that had not previously flourished in places like Japan or Germany uh, all that much. And I think one of the most important moments in this process came early on in the occupation of Germany when General Clay, who was the American general running the occupation, ordered the creation of an opposition German newspaper whose task it would be to criticize the actions of the American authorities. And this uh, uh, opposition uh, was something that had to be ordered by uh, the authorities themselves. And I would argue that's a fairly unusual thing, you know, for a military commander with total authority to order people to criticize him. But Clay was a Democrat with a small d. Clay understood democratic politics and he understood the importance of building this kind of politics and indeed MacArthur understood this too in Japan. So the critical role of the United States in planting democratic politics as well as market economics in these two countries and then the seeding effect that that had elsewhere in the world, it seems to me by 1960, certainly by 1970, had settled once and for all this great question of what is the best way to organize uh, a society. Um, and uh, from that time on, uh, the Soviet Union was very much on the defensive uh, in, this, in this regard. Uh, and certainly it had not necessarily been at the time that the Cold War started. So I think that's a plus for looking at the Cold War um, as well. I think uh, another plus that I would mention something we don't often associate with the Cold War uh, 
is the recovery of a sense of principle, binding principle, uh, in the conduct of nations uh, with respect to human rights, even reinforcement of the principles of law. Now, the Cold War was generally regarded as an unprincipled period. The hopes that many people had that the United Nations would institute the rule of law in world affairs were very quickly frustrated in the early days of the Cold War. And many of the early American documents in the Cold War period sound very much like Machiavelli. Machiavelli, you'll recall, said in The Prince that because the world is full of people who are not good, the prince must himself learn not to be good. And that message was uh, pretty widely exchanged among American policymakers in the early Cold War period. The fear was that, the sense was, that because we were dealing with a brutal and nasty opponent, there were times when we had to be brutal and cynical and amoral uh, as well. And that prevailed, and there are plenty of instances of this which you'll recall from your own study of history in the early uh, Cold War period. But what is fascinating to me is that a backlash developed against this in the middle of the Cold War, somewhere along the line in the 1960s, certainly by the early 1970s, perhaps because of the credibility gap that arose in the Johnson administration with Vietnam, perhaps because of a press that, and media that were prepared to um, accord greater scrutiny to administration activities, certainly because of the Watergate crisis in the early 1970s. Uh, the idea that the United States government was free to do whatever it wanted, that it was free to let its opponents determine its own morality, that idea went by the board. That idea went out along with Richard Nixon when he left the White House in 1974. Um, and I think that's a plus for the reassertion of constitutional and congressional authority uh, over the conduct of foreign policy. You can't do just everything uh, you want to do just because the president says it's legal doesn't make it legal. That principle was established uh, in the Cold War. What also happened, what also happened, which I think is even more interesting and less written about, <clears throat> is the extent to which something like this happened on the Soviet side. It happened by different means. There was no media scrutiny. There was no uh, constitutional standard that bound uh, Soviet leaders. But what did happen was that over a long period of time, <clears throat> in the 1950s and the early 1960s, Soviet leaders, in order to compete effectively in the Cold War, educated a whole generation of, um, uh, sent a whole generation of, of people to college, chiefly to study science and technology. <clears throat> but having accorded them higher education, having made them the first higher, ed the first uh, generation of Soviet youth to go through mass higher education. Um, kind of spark of intellectual curiosity and from curiosity a spark of uh, dissent uh, began to be uh, uh, manifested in thousands, millions of quiet kitchen table conversations uh, late at night in the Russian way or conversations in parks or whatnot. Uh, all of which led to a sense that the government, meaning the Kremlin, is not always right, that ideology uh, provides no guarantee of infallibility. <clears throat> and by the 1970s, uh, concern about the rise of dissent within the Soviet Union was mounting to the stage that um, the Soviet leadership spent, uh, as we know from the documents, uh, days and days and weeks and even months debating with themselves what to do about people like Solzhenitsyn and Sakharov. I don't think Stalin would have spent much time debating about what to do with Solzhenitsyn and Sakharov. Something was going on here, a sense of <clears throat> sensitivity to public opinion, a sense of sensitivity to world opinion, a sense that the Soviet Union had an interest in becoming more respectable in its image uh, in the world. <clears throat> and I think that had a lot to do with why the Brezhnev regime made this still very puzzling decision to sign on to the basket three human rights provisions of the Helsinki Final Act in 1975. The Helsinki Final Act was intended simply to ratify the boundaries in uh, Eastern Europe, but it was uh, the Western Europeans and the Canadians uh, 
uh, with some reluctance and misgivings on the part of the Americans, tacked on the human rights provisions, which basically were a restatement of the UN Human Rights uh, Charter. And the Russians signed on to this rather surprisingly. Even more surprisingly, they were forced to honor these agreements. And this began to happen in a curious way. You know, probably some of you have wondered about the impact of rock music on the Cold War. Well, I can tell you it was very important. <clears throat> How many people have heard of the plastic people of the universe? <laughs> Not too many. You guys are going to have to learn about this group. This was a rather bad Czech rock band <clears throat> from the 1970s. I play tapes for my students, and so they say, that's terrible. You know? <laughs> but I say it's important because uh, the plastic people of the universe uh, were an underground band that played uh, in forests and in basements uh, unauthorized by the authorities. And in 1976, they were caught up with, they were arrested, they were put on trial. And a young playwright attended the trial and was outraged by what he saw there. His name was Václav Havel. Mm -hmm. And Václav Havel then went on, because of his anger over the treatment of the plastic people, to organize Charter 77 which was the movement throughout Eastern Europe and into the Soviet Union itself to hold the Soviet authorities to what they had put their names on the dotted line for in the Helsinki Final Act, that is, honoring uh, human rights. So this was a totally unexpected development. Who would have expected uh, something like that? How much attention did these old guys in the Kremlin give to uh, the plastic people of the universe? Probably not very much. Uh, and yet it profoundly affected uh, what they were able to do. How much attention did they give to what was happening um, within the Roman Catholic Church in this period as well? This is one of the rare instances, 1978, in which it can be documented that God intervened in human affairs. Uh, the selection of Pope John Paul II, obviously divine inspiration, uh, and obviously a huge impact uh, on the conduct of the Cold War. There is, as uh, people in the Cold War Project know, fascinating correspondence from KGB chief Andropov to his agent in Warsaw saying, how could you let this happen? How could you let a Pope be elected Pope? Mm -hmm. And the word came back that, well, actually, the KGB's competency to uh, infiltrate and influence papal conclaves is limited, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well. John Paul's election, and more particularly his great trip to uh, Poland in uh, the summer of 1979, um, in effect ended communism in Eastern Europe. All that had to happen was that the Pope uh, stepped onto Polish soil, kissed the ground, and said, be not afraid. And that was enough. And um, right there, the whole facade, uh, at least uh, spiritually and psychologically, came crumbling down because this residual spiritual faith of the Polish people, which had been there always, uh, is rekindled by this event. And once again, these are things for which the traditional categories of Marxist-Leninist analysis have no uh, response. Stalin said once, how many divisions has the Pope? Uh, John Paul's answer was, I don't need divisions in the first place. The Pope was an actor before he became a priest. And one of the other things that strikes me about this period of the late 1970s and the early 1980s is what a fruitful period this was for actors, for people who were able to dramatize their position, people who were able to leap over the traditional conventional wisdom and achieve uh, great breakthroughs. And of course, one of the best examples is uh, the only professional movie star ever to have been president of the United States, Mr. Reagan himself with the challenges that he hurled uh, to the Soviet Union in the 1980s. We used to think that because Reagan was a movie star, he was a lightweight, uh, don't believe it. Uh, he turns out to have been one of the most adept grand strategists ever, and one of the most interesting intellectuals uh, ever uh, to be president of the United States. And if you look at the documents that are now available, his own thinking, his own writing in the period before he became president, there is a clearer and fuller and more consistent record of independent thinking uh, 
He had his own radio program, wrote his own scripts out in longhand, and all of the ideas of the Reagan presidency are in those radio uh, scripts in the 1970s, before he ever became president. There is no other American president in the 20th century for whom we have a more precise written record of his thinking and what he would do when he got into office than we have with uh, Ronald Reagan. So I don't need to suggest to you the impact that Reagan had with his rhetoric, with his challenges to the conventional wisdom, with his um, willingness to make the point that detente had to be killed in order to end the Cold War because what detente was designed to do was to perpetuate uh, the Cold War. But having killed detente, then he also understood, as in the Jim and Sally speech, that the way had to be left open for some uh, resolution of differences. And I think that, in a powerful way, paves the way uh, for Gorbachev, who himself then becomes a decisive actor in these events uh, through processes and by ways that we all know. So my point, just to sum up, is that there are a lot of reasons for remembering the Cold War in a more positive way than the cover designers of my book uh, wanted to try to do, uh, that it established certain principles, the non-use of lethal weapons, uh, the superiority of market economics and democratic politics, the recovery of a sense of equity, the uh, demonstrated proof that individuals still make a difference at top levels of leadership. These are all things that were important to establish. And I would conclude just by suggesting that there are some analogies between the Cold War and the American Civil War. It is often said of the American Civil War that, horrible though it was, it was a necessary war because it resolved some long-standing issues, like what to do about slavery, like what is the constitutional relationship between the states and the federal government. It was a war that had to be fought, though no one would wish to refight it or to relive it. And it seems to me that the Cold War falls into something like that category, a necessary war that settled some very important points. We have no reason to regret its being fought. We certainly have no reason to regret its outcome. We have no reason, though, to want to go back there uh, and live there and experience it again. Thanks for your attention. <clears throat> you can sit or stand as you choose. Um, uh, Professor Gaddis has uh, kindly consented to take questions for a period. We'll do that uh, for a few minutes here. We'll begin with this gentleman right, uh, right here. Is there a microphone nearby? Yes. Would you hand the microphone to him, please? Hi, Mr. Gaddis. Um, I've read some of your writings on contemporary foreign policy, and I'm sure you'll agree that history has a purpose to guide us through the future. What lessons do you think we should take with us, particularly in this time in crafting foreign policy? Well, I think we have to be very careful to try to sort out uh, similarities and differences in looking at current um, situations. It's too easy to make automatic, simplistic uh, transfers. Let me just throw you one uh, example, which is uh, the allegation that a lot of people make that Iraq is Vietnam. Um, that's both true and false, it seems to me, and it's important to be clear on which is which. You know, it seems to me it's true in the sense that um, what happens on the home front, what happens here in this country in terms of political support or absence of support for the war is going to be very important in the, the success with which the war can be prosecuted. We know that that was true in Vietnam. We know, in fact, that the war was lost at home even as it was being won on the battlefield uh, in Vietnam. On the other hand, it seems to me there are important uh, differences in the sense that uh, the insurgency in Iraq is not getting superpower support to the extent that uh, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese did from the Soviet Union and China. Uh, the Iraqi insurgency is not a unified movement. It's actually three separate movements, and there is a balance of power between them. Uh, and it's entirely possible that if we were to announce tomorrow that we were leaving, we might have the Sunnis, the Shia, and the Kurds all saying, please don't leave because we maintain a kind of a stability in that country that could be lost if we were um, out of there. So uh, the casualty rate certainly is nothing like what it was in Vietnam. The level of domestic disruption in this country is nothing like what it was in Vietnam. So I think the answer to your question is to take issues like that and then try to make a list, similarities and differences. Uh, 
And don't fall for the simplistic notion that something is going to be exactly the same, because um, as that great uh, student of history, Mark Twain, once said, uh, history does not repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. <laughs> OK, uh, Rob. Thank you, John. In addition uh, to being a Cold War historian and broad, uh, looking at the Cold War in broad brush, you're also George Kennan's biog biographer. Could you discuss Kennan's uh, contribution in terms of framing the issues and how his prophecy, so to speak, came to pass in the 1980s with the mellowing, so to speak, of the Soviet Union? Um, how many days do I have for that? <laughs> um, let me just say that um, one of the things that Kennan uh, said in his great um, X article, The Sources of Soviet Conduct, which I'm sure some of you have read from Foreign Affairs, July 1947, was that there was a third way with regard to the Soviet Union. You didn't have to fight a third world war with the Soviet Union. You did not have to undertake appeasement as had been done with Nazi Germany in the run-up to World War II. There was a third way, which was containment. If you bolster the strength and the security and the self-confidence of the West, then sooner or later, Soviet efforts to spread their ideology and to spread their political influence uh, would simply run up against barriers. They would be uh, frustrated. And sooner or later, the level of frustration would mount to the point that the Soviet leadership itself uh, would reconsider its own policies perhaps replace its uh, existing leaders, perhaps even revise its own system. Kennan was vague as to how long that, took, that would take. I think in his original thinking, he probably guessed 15 years. It was closer to something like 45 years before that happened. Uh, but it did happen. And part of the implication of Kennan is that we should, we the Americans and the Western alliance, uh, should uh, not directly confront the Russians in an aggressive way, but we should do whatever we could to make life difficult for them to put the system under strain so as to accelerate this process of uh, frustration. Now, if you compare that with what Reagan actually did in the 1980s, which was to place the Soviet Union under strain in the hopes of persuading the Soviet uh, leaders to reconsider their policies and perhaps uh, their system itself, I think it's really pretty close to the Kennan uh, original vision from 1947. I know from personal experience that Mr. Kennan was not himself completely comfortable with this comparison. But I also know that in the end, uh, he did come around to acknowledging uh, the distinctive role that Reagan played along with Gorbachev in ending the Cold War. So that's the connection, Rob, that I would see in this. Uh, Christian? John, it's wonderful to have you here. Um, the title of your new book, um, The Cold War, um, A New History, has a certain finality. And even the title of your last book had a certain finality about it. We now know. <laughs> um, you understand I have a certain professional interest in, the, uh, in, the, in my question, that is, what do we uh, still have to learn about the Cold War? What mm. do we not know yet? Uh, am I going to be out of a job? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a lot still to know. I, 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 I hope there is finality in this, uh, last, in this book. I really hope this is the last book on the Cold War <laughs> itself. You know, it's, it's high time. I keep telling myself this, but um, you know, I'm, I'm overexposed when it comes to the Cold War. You know, I need to do something else. Um, but anyway, uh, what do we still have uh, to learn? Um, I think an enormous amount, uh, as you know very well, Christian, from the sources on the other side. It seems to me in many ways we've only scratched the surface of this. Uh, all of China really in some way is uh, still to be opened up uh, in, this, in this regard. And surely that's true of um, many other countries, uh, including Russia uh, as well. So the Cold War is still going to be a fruitful um, occupation for historians, it seems to me, for a long time. Please remember the Peloponnesian War is still a fruitful occupation for historians. <laughs> historians will always find something new to say about whatever event in the past you may want to. Employment is not going to be a problem, I think, in that regard. Um, it, um, um, I do think that uh, the time has come to begin some kind of a debate. Uh, about what did it all mean. 
uh, that is the backing off historical maturity uh, argument. I would like to see that argument proceed alongside the continuing uh, revelations uh, from the archives because it seems to me that's a very fruitful dialogue to look at the detail but then to be revising the big picture and then come back and look at new detail and revise the big picture and so on and so forth. If we are able to uh, do this, then Cold War historians are going to be in business for about the next uh, 2,000 years, I think, if the Peloponnesian War is any guide. Huh? All right, sir. John, it's so nice to have you with us. Uh, a uh, application of the the book that the question that I have is, and you're uh, very much appreciate you paying tribute to a budding historian, Khalid, and his concept. Is there a way to bring the things you've learned and the concept of, ma of historical maturity? here and now to the practice of policy? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think there are ways to do this. Part of the problem, however, is that the practitioners of policy do have one or two other things to do besides reading us. Um, so the um, extent to which you can expect uh, the President of the United States or his advisors to be following uh, what we are writing in detail um, is, I think, uh, pretty limited. But I would just make uh, one point. Uh, much depends on individuals uh, in this regard. I don't think there's any way that you can organize this kind of thing. I think it simply depends on the level of intellectual curiosity of leadership at the top. One thing I would say about President Bush is that he reads history. And my own sense is that he probably reads more history than any American president since John F. Kennedy. Uh, now, what do you make of this? Uh, what impact does it have on his own thinking? I think that will have to await his biographers. But uh, we know the reading list, and it's some small books, like one of mine, but it's also some very big books, like uh, Chernow on Hamilton, or Zheng Chang on Mao Zedong. Uh, so um, I think one has to hope that one can simply instill in people who rise to the top a kind of a personal sense of historical curiosity. And I hope that's what the teaching of history actually does. I hope the teaching of history is exciting enough that it doesn't turn people off and they say, I never want to touch history again. You know, uh, And that should be our objective, I think, is to make our teaching uh, compelling in that regard. OK, there's a question here and then in the back, uh, this, this young man here. Uh, hello, Mr. Gaddis. It's nice to put a face to one of the big books we have in history today. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, you mentioned the uh, Plastic People, uh, the Czech mm -hmm. rock band. Where are you? Uh, Wave your hand. I can <coughs> see you. Oh, I'm sorry. Right. Okay. And so um, I was wondering if you thought that had any sort of impact or, or if you would care to comment on uh, the concept of the tail wagging the dog, so to speak. Sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a whole chapter on tails and dogs um, in this book because that's a really important point in Cold War history. And um, whether you consider it a positive or a negative depends on your point of view. So I didn't list it you know, along with my uh, automatic positives about the Cold War. But I guess it's positive if you are a tail. Um, so uh, there are lots of examples. Um, of this that happened. And in fact, I think one of the most fascinating things about the Cold War is the extent to which it allowed a considerable degree of autonomy to um, actors who would have been considered weak under normal circumstances, but because of the artificialities of the Cold War, uh, gained strength. One of the prime examples is Korea, which Catherine Weathersby, of course, has done the pioneering uh, work on. And we had known for a very long time the unpredictability of the South Korean leader, Syngman Rhee, uh, who was uh, a tail who wagged our dog uh, repeatedly and generally got what he wanted. What we hadn't realized until Catherine's work and the work of others here at the project was the extent to which exactly the same thing seems to have been happening on the North Korean side, the extent to which uh, Kim Il-sung uh, uh, could wag the Soviet dog and get what he wanted. And they both did it in much the same way. They would simply threaten to collapse they would say, if you don't do what I want you to do, we will collapse and you will be sorry. And in the fraught context of the Cold War, in the situation where it was believed that 
enormous importance attached to maintaining the precise exact status quo in this divided country, Korea. They were able to get, a, get away with a lot. And uh, that's only one of about eight or nine different examples that I could give you. So uh, there's a chapter, there's a whole chapter on this um, in the book. It's a good question. All the way in the back. Yeah. Uh, Professor Gaddis, thank you very much for a very interesting lecture. Um, and a lot of American history, uh, a non-American like myself, has uh, learned from your um, writings. As you assess the Cold War, would you like to talk a little bit about uh, um, the last uh, major Cold War, which, uh, which was in fact a covert war fought against the Soviets from Afghanistan, and looking at really what a lot of people have subsequently uh, argued that uh, the way that war was fought led to the problem of terrorism today. Would you like to reflect on that? Thank you. Well, I have heard that statement made, and uh, there is some truth in it, because it certainly is the case that in the period when the Soviets were in Afghanistan, the, um, the um, Carter administration and later the Reagan administration provided support to the Mujahideen mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. And some of the Mujahideen later uh, evolved into the Taliban and so on and so forth. So uh, there is some case to be made uh, for this. Was this the determining cause, though? Was it what actually caused the creation of the Taliban, then led to the collaboration between the Taliban and uh, bin Laden, then led directly to uh, September 11th? Uh, I don't think that can be proven. I think there are too many other variables in that mix uh, to account uh, or to say that that was the causative uh, factor. History is always complex. Um, political scientists are um, constantly pressing me to specify the independent variable that is the critical thing that caused something to happen. I think independent variables are like tooth fairies. I don't think that they really exist. All variables are interdependent. So I could cite, we don't have time to go into this today, but I could cite six or eight other things uh, in that complex of circumstances that could have led to this event. I think what you have to do as a historian um, is just to try to be aware of uh, what was really uh, going on. And don't let your mind be pulled towards some predetermined uh, conclusion. It's very easy to do that. And you can sometimes even make a big splash by alleging something like this. But I don't think this is historical maturity. Historical maturity acknowledges the uh, combinations of complex causes that come together in situations like this. And this, I think, was uh, certainly one of these complex situations. All right, sir. I noticed in your new book an incre uh, increased focus on China and China's role in the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if any of the new scholarship that's come out on China, particularly from Jun Cheng and John Holliday, suggesting that the Soviet Union mm -hmm. had a much greater role than was originally thought in the Chinese Revolution, mm -hmm. how that affects your interpretation of the rise of communism in the mm -hmm. first half of the 20th century, mm -hmm. and how Mao and China went from what would seem like having a great debt to the Soviet Union yep. to sort of having this uh -huh. tail wagging the dog relationship sure. yep. that you suggest uh -huh. they had. Well, I'm not a China specialist by any means, but uh, the evidence, uh, again, produced by this project here and other evidence uh, strongly suggests that, in fact, there was much more Soviet influence than we thought in the period of the Chinese Civil War itself uh, before Mao came to power. It was, however, as much ideological influence as it was direct military and economic assistance, from what I can tell. And this gets back to a major point that has come out of the new uh, research which is that ideology actually was very important and that Marxist-Leninists took that ideology quite um, seriously. So Mao's deference to Stalin in that period uh, is a lot greater than what we had previously thought, and it's deference that's based on ideological uh, grounds. So uh, in that period, yes, I think that the relationship was uh, closer. It then uh, runs into problems in various ways. Uh, as Mao himself uh, seeks to establish his own authority as the head of the international communist movement. He was prepared to defer to Stalin. He was never prepared to defer to Khrushchev. Uh, and he had this bad habit of receiving poor Khrushchev in his swimming pool. Khrushchev, not a very good swimmer, and uh, obviously ill at ease under these um, circumstances. Uh, so there were a lot of things that led to the Sino-Soviet uh, split. 
Uh, but certainly one of the things is Mao's own belief that he deserved to be the leader of international communism in the wake of the death of uh, Stalin. And okay. I think that uh, that is uh, something that most of us are agreeing on these days. Excuse me, John. I, uh, we have time for two more questions, sure. one here and one over there. Okay. Yeah. You've Please. given us some very valuable insights on the Cold War, but you have not mentioned the people-to-people -people contacts. It was more than just Reagan and Gorbachev. During the 30 years after Stalin's death, an entire generation of the Soviet intelligentsia came to the West, to the United States and Western Europe, and came to realize how far behind the Soviet Union was and that communism mm -hmm. had failed. Mm -hmm. I do mention this in the book, uh, and just didn't have time to do it today, but you're right, it's extraordinarily uh, important. Um, I think it's a real challenge for a historian to try to write about great historical forces, to try to write about great individual leaders, but then also to acknowledge that ordinary people made a huge difference. And I try to do this in the book in several different ways, particularly talking about the extent to which ordinary people took over the shaping of the momentum of events in 1989 which uh, I think uh, they certainly did. So that's um, in the book. I acknowledge the importance of it. Just didn't have time to go into it in detail this morning. Okay, we'll conclude here. Uh, hello, Mr. Gaddis. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was wondering if we could go back to George Frost Kennan's role and um, if you could shed some light onto why President Truman decided to go beyond his policy of a containment to the sort of rollback policy mm -hmm. of NSC 68 and sure and uh, mm -hmm. why he went beyond sure. what uh, Kennan wanted to do and his, his leaving the yeah. State Department because of that. Well, part of it depends on what you mean by rollback. If by rollback you mean encouraging fragmentation within the international communist movement, Kennan was all in favor of that and was in fact the architect of our policy toward Yugoslavia in 1948, the first time that we took advantage of splits within the international communist movement. If by rollback you mean actual aggressive military operations or covert operations to try to um, uh, challenge uh, Soviet authority, uh, that he had many more reservations about, despite the fact that he actually was the originator of the idea of covert operations in the early Central Intelligence Agency. Why did he leave the government and why did Truman move beyond um, his recommendations? I think it was a couple of reasons. Uh, many of Kennan's recommendations uh, simply boil down to the idea that you had to have steady nerves, and that meant that you accepted that some parts of the world were vital and other parts of the world uh, were not. It's hard to have steady nerves in a situation where you see China uh, collapsing, you know, going communist, and yet uh, Kennan is saying it's not going to be a, a big problem. It's hard to have steady nerves when you see the Europeans pressing for a NATO alliance, and Kennan says they don't need one, and the Europeans said, yes, we do. Uh, and so it's hard to maintain steady nerves in that situation. Uh, Kennan also, I think, uh, himself, in terms of his personality, was not a bureaucratic survivor. Bureaucratic survivors have the ability to lose bureaucratic battles and bounce back. And Kennan never had that ability. He took his uh, setbacks too personally. Uh, he was too sensitive in that regard, uh, too easily bruised to survive in this rather brutal uh, environment. And so made his contribution, I think, in a very important and influential way, but fairly quickly decided that his subsequent contribution would be to go off to the Institute of Advanced History and do what the rest of us do, which is just to write history. Okay, let's express our appreciation to Professor Gaddis. Uh, May I say we're delighted at the center to have our young guests uh, with us. Uh, you're welcome here anytime. Uh, we are adjourned. Terrific. Very pleased. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.